At 1.06 a.m. on March 23, 1951, Good Friday, a C-124 Globemaster II of the United States Air Force, bound from Maine to the United Kingdom, made a routine contact to Oceanic Control in Ireland, giving a revised estimate for its time of arrival. That plane, with 53 men on board, never reached its destination. It has become one of the enduring mysteries of the United States Air Force. A mystery so strange that a relative of one of the survivors said that it is almost like a spy novel. The Douglas C-124 Globemaster II was a development of the World War II vintage Douglas C-74. Introduced in 1950, the Tacoma Washington News Tribune reported in 1951 that the C-124 was a product of the lessons learned during the 1948 Berlin Airlift. A bigger ship, military air transport service observers reasoned, built for delivering freight of huge bulk, would have pruned out the congested air lanes, cut down the complexities of loading and unloading, and chopped off the delay in refueling. A plane was needed that would haul three times the load, using the same crew size, as the C-54, the workhorse of the airlift. The paper described the new airplane as resembling nothing so much as a flying warehouse. While the Air Force and the public was excited about the plane in 1951, a 2021 edition of Flying Magazine noted that the plane's role was seen as somewhat limited, writing that some historians have called the C-124 a low-budget stopgap on the way to designing more effective cargo planes. The plane tended to be quite loud, and, Flying Magazine notes, the C-124 tended to shake a lot, even in calm skies, earning it the nickname Old Shaky. While they were renowned for their size, the plane would eventually have a troubled record. Flying Magazine notes, there were gas leaks, a series of engine fires, and some were found to have faulty generators on their motors. The Aviation Safety Network lists the C-124 as suffering some 62 total hull losses over the length of the plane's career. The first of those occurred on March 23, 1951. The C-124, tail number 49244 and assigned to the 4th Air Division, Strategic Air Command at Gander, Newfoundland, took off from Walker Air Force Base in Roswell, New Mexico on March 21st. The flight crew was commanded by Major Robert J. Bell of the 2nd Strategic Support Squadron. Its mission was, well, vague. According to documents provided by the Army to the Pam Texas News, the purpose of the flight was to take personnel for routine inspections of UK air bases. But Barry Peterson, son of Captain Walter Peterson, noted that the plane's mission was less than routine. He recalled to the Amarillo, Texas Globe News in 2012, He kept coming back to hug us and coming back to hug us. They were not optimistic about returning. My mother just said that they were on a secret mission. Peterson's daughter, Mary, told the Globe News that a letter sent from one of the crewmen to his wife read, The date of departure, route, and mission are classified secret, so we'll have to wait to tell you about them. We are all a little confused. Don't know what to do about arranging our affairs. I have arranged distribution of partnership in case of death. So what was this mysterious secret mission that had people on the plane concerned that they might not be coming home? It is just one question of many regarding this flight. According to detailed research done by Roy Wagner, the son of Captain Walter Wagner, another passenger on the aircraft, Highlands Lake, Texas 101 News reported in 2017, the plane flew to Barksdale Air Force Base near Shreveport, Louisiana, where it spent the night. Before leaving on March 22nd, Brigadier General Paul T. Cullen and his staff joined the flight. This is relevant, Roy pointed out, because Cullen was the commanding officer of the new 7th Air Group, assigned to England. According to the United States Air Force, the 7th Air Division was activated on 20 March 1951, stationed at Victoria Park Estate, South Ryslip, England, and assigned to Strategic Air Command. It exercised control over SAC forces deployed to the United Kingdom. The Shreveport, Louisiana Times wrote in 2014, Cullen and the senior staffers were en route to England to set up the 7th Air Division, which would spearhead any assault against the Soviet Union during a time of increasing tensions with the Communist bloc as the Korean War intensified. The plane then continued to Loring Air Force Base in Limestone, Maine. There, the plane refueled, and the pilots and navigators received a weather briefing and filed a flight plan for the final leg of the journey. 
The Pampa News writes, on March 22, 1951, the Douglas C-124, 49-244, Globemaster II, lumbered into the transatlantic skies from Limestone Air Force Base, with the planned destination being Royal Air Force Base in Lakenheath, England. The Museum of Walker Air Force Base writes that the flight route was over the weather ships that linked the American continent to the British Isles. Along the route, they checked in with each ship, giving a position report, status on board, and receiving updated weather. The Pampa News reports that at 1.06 a.m. on Good Friday, March 23, 1951, the Globemaster sent out its last routine message to Oceanic Control, announcing that they would be changing their estimated time of arrival. They did not report any issues with the functionality of the plane. 101 News reports that the crew contacted Control in Ireland to change the plane's arrival time to about 6 a.m. GMT, a full 30 minutes earlier than first anticipated. Here already the various stories diverge. The Walker Museum writes that shortly thereafter the C-124 gave out a mayday call, reporting a fire in the cargo crates. They began jettisoning the crates and announced that they were ditching. However, the Pampa News writes that a letter sent by the Air Force to surviving relatives did not mention the Mayday call, instead writing that the last radio contact with the plane revealed that it was over the North Atlantic Ocean, several hundred miles west of Ireland, when no further report was received and it became known that the aircraft was overdue. 101 News writes that some published accounts claim the crew later reported a fire on board and that they had to ditch, but through his countless hours of going over hundreds of pages of reports and accounts, Roy Wagner never found an official statement about that. That is not the only discrepancy that Roy Wagner found. 101 News reports, One of the Air Force logs indicates the Globemaster might have landed in Gander, Newfoundland, Canada, before cutting across the ocean. This one record has an entry that gives the impression that the plane landed in Newfoundland. But there's no other report that it did. So why this discrepancy, and what might the plane have picked up in Newfoundland? In any case, 101 News writes that the Globemaster failed to make its scheduled 2 a.m. location report and apparently vanished. At 3.49 a.m. GMT, officials in England issued an alert for the aircraft, but it was 9.20 a.m. before they declared the Globemaster missing, more than three hours after the plane was due to arrive. The crash made the news the same day, with the Buffalo News reporting a giant U.S. transport plane with 53 persons aboard vanished in fog and rain over the Atlantic Ocean today while en route from the United States to England. One of the passengers was a Brigadier General. Although the Lewiston, Maine Evening Journal reported that the Air Force said mid-morning, however, that it still held hopes for the plane because it could have reached Iceland or the Azores. Communications with those areas have been bad now for hours. The letter that was sent to relatives of those aboard noted that one of the largest air and sea organized search efforts ever instituted for a single plane was launched. Although the New Iberia, Louisiana Daily Iberian reported on the 23rd that so far the rescue planes have found no trace of the wreckage, survivors, or life rafts. But a headline in the New York Times read, Flares in the Atlantic Spur Hope on the 24th. The Times reported that a United States Air Force officer at Shannon Airport said earlier today that the pilot of a search plane had reported sighting flares and wreckage along the Atlantic route followed by a huge United States Air Force C-124, missing for 24 hours with 53 persons on board. But, the Times noted, the RAF officer on the rescue plane said that the seas were running high and that there were strong winds in the area, and that Air Force Major Horace A. Stevenson said that, in the darkness, the pilot may have been mistaken. The report disturbed Roy Wagner. The plane that had supposedly sighted the flares was a B-29 that, Wagner says, wasn't equipped for a rescue mission, lacked the needed gear or even supplies for helping anyone found at sea. That doesn't make any sense, he said. They send out one plane, and there's nothing it can do if it finds anyone? Moreover, he notes, while the B-29 spotted the life raft and stayed on the scene, The 509th in England didn't send another aircraft to relieve the B-29, especially one with rescue gear. Some reports claim more detail, with the Walker Aviation Museum writing that the aircraft was intact when it touched down on the ocean. All hands exited the aircraft wearing life preservers and climbed into the inflated five-man life rafts, and that the pilot that the Walker Museum describes as a U.S. Air Force pilot as opposed to a British pilot, as the report in the Times said, located the men when they fired several flares. But the Times reported that Major Stevenson said that I'm afraid that it will take some time, 
possibly hours for the weather ships to get where the flares had been spotted. Wagner worried that even if the B-29 crew spotted anyone, it might be too late for most of the people on board the ill-fated Globemaster. In his exhaustive search of the available records, Wagner told 101 News that he found that the Globemaster didn't have enough survival gear for the passengers, and that there were six nine-man rafts on board, but all the bailing pails were missing and had not been replaced. So if they ended up ditching in the water, if the rafts get swamped or flipped, they didn't have anything to bail them out with. By the 25th, the crew had not been located, but Weathership Charles had located an Air Force valise, essentially a briefcase. The valise was the first object actually to be picked up as a possible clue to the whereabouts of the huge Army transport C-124. The Times reported it was found as hopes were fading for the missing men. But they were never found. On the 30th, the Times reported that the United States Air Force Globemaster, missing since Good Friday, was blown to bits by a terrific explosion that almost certainly killed all the 53 men on board, an Air Force spokesman said today. The official Air Force letter to the family read, Examination of the debris by qualified experts revealed that the plane had apparently burned and exploded. But this explanation was already problematic given the reports that pilots had seen flares. Wagner told 101 News, We know people were alive out there because dead people don't shoot flares. The claim of an explosion further came into question 64 years after the accident. The Shreveport Times writes that the Times Freedom of Information Act request to the CIA, State Department, and Air Force, all of which would have had an interest in the loss of Cullen and all the high-value personnel on the airplane, elicited a meaningful response only from the Air Force, which provided a report into the crash which, while remarkable for providing little meaningful information in more than 160 often unreadably faded pages, still turned up a few brain busters. Among those was a summary that read, the aircraft was evidently, more or less, intact when it hit. This is indicated by the small number of pieces recovered, as well as the fact that two inflated aircraft tires carried as part of the cargo were never found. Also, the debris found was burned by fuel fire from fuel in the wing fuel cells, which indicated that the wing fuel cells were still attached to the fuselage. The conclusion suggested that any explosion would have occurred later, and the men may have survived, lending credence to reports that flares and life rafts had been sighted. The Walker Museum website writes that ships and planes continued searching for the next several days, but not a single body was found. The men of C-124, number 490244, had quite simply disappeared. The loss of the C-124 was the first total loss and first fatality for the airframe. Although another crash, blamed on engine failure, occurred in Indiana the following May, killing seven. Notable about the March crash, however, is how many details seem to still be missing. Wagner told 101 News, there's just a bunch of things that don't make sense. Retired Air Force Master Sergeant Keith Amsden, whose brother, Robert, was a flight engineer on the doomed plane, agreed, telling the Lafayette, Louisiana Daily Advertiser that, I've been stonewalled. I know there's something hidden. The Pampa News reported, the U.S. government appears to have classified, declassified, and reclassified details pertinent to the disappearance of the plane multiple times over the last 69 years, according to surviving relatives of the crew. There have also been contradictory statements made by the government, leading surviving family members of those lost at sea to believe the whole truth has been hidden from them. The conflicting stories, lack of answers, have led to several theories many surrounding the importance of General Cullen and the personnel aboard. The Shreveport Times noted that Cullen alone would have been a treasure trove of sensitive intelligence. He was the Air Service's leading expert on aerial reconnaissance and aerial photography and had served as commander of the 2nd Operations Group on two occasions during World War II. Adding to the speculation was the fact that Cullen had been stationed in the Soviet Union during the Second World War, so that Cullen would have been known to the Soviets. Moreover, the Times writes, while Cullen and his aides were what people today would call high-value targets, most of the other passengers and crew of the transport also were important. Most were nuclear technicians, top flyers, and crew chiefs with the 509th Bomb Wing, then the nation's elite nuclear unit. Could the plane have been brought down by sabotage? The New York Times reported at the time that a spokesman for the Air Force said that in any investigation of this kind, the possibility of sabotage must be taken into account. Wagner noted in 101 News that the aircraft was left unattended by the flight crew for a period of time, though supposedly it was locked, while at Loring. You have the commanding officer of a major Air Force unit on it, he said. You don't leave a plane like that unguarded. 
The Shreveport Times noted that the accident report also includes several pages reporting on analysis of chemical traces found on some of the debris consistent with a four-pound incendiary bomb from a type used in World War II, though this was not on the cargo manifest. And the word sabotage also is prominently a heading on numerous pages in the report, noting that the plane manufacturer, Douglas Aircraft Company, also conducted tests on the recovered pieces and concluded the Globemaster had a fire at some point, but discovered one piece of metal was not from the plane or any of the cargo listed on the manifest. An official report indicated the metal came from a U.S.-made bomb. 101 News reported that Wagner points to the time the Globemaster was left unguarded at Limestone. If the plane had been brought down by sabotage, who could be behind it? The Bureau of Aircraft Accidents Archive writes that it has been speculated that Cullen and his companions were taken aboard Soviet submarines and brought to Russia for interrogation. The Pampa News writes that it is important to note that Soviet submarines were active in the area at the time of the Globemaster's demise. Could the Soviets have brought down the plane? And might they have been the reason that no crew were found? The Daily Advertiser notes that Soviet submarines and surface vessels have been reported as active in the area where the C-124 ditched, with trawlers shadowing the weather ships that track the transport's progress and finally relate its mayday calls. Roy Wagner told 101 News that at least the Americans considered the possibility that the Russians had captured the survivors. During his extensive search of documents, he found that in May 2016, U.S. Defense Intelligence Officer Tim Shea had asked General Lieutenant Vasily S. Kristofferov of the Russian Federal Security Service for archival materials located in the Russian Navy archives, which might shed light on the fate of this C-124 and its 53 passengers, to which Kristofferov had replied, it's a better request, and we'll look it up. Even more intriguing, the Pampa News reported, nearly one month later, an elderly Irish man named John Faherty found a tin can while walking along the beach. Faherty removed the lid and found a note inside that read, Cullen is worried when 300 miles west of Ireland, Globemaster alters course for no apparent reason. We are going north, have to be careful. We are under surveillance. Pieces of wreckage will be found, but are not of G-Master. Terrible drama is being enacted in this liner. The Shreveport Times notes that the note was turned over to authorities and has since disappeared. It was referred to in the incident report, but not copied. While noting that the mystery still lingers, Barry Peterson told the Amarillo News Globe that at this point, I can't buy into with any honesty the Russian spy intrigue spinoff. At least I don't want to think my father died in a Russian gulag under deplorable circumstances. I prefer to think that he was asleep on that plane and killed instantly. Roy Wagner expressed a similar sentiment, but a different conclusion. The thought of my dad spending his years in some Soviet gulag, I hate the thought of that, but I'm thinking that could very well have happened. That scares the hell out of me. The Shreveport Times noted the C-124 and its personnel are not listed among the almost 130 U.S. civilian government and military personnel known to have been captured by the Soviets and unaccounted for during the Cold War. Most of these personnel were on reconnaissance aircraft. Finally, another important question. What might have been on that plane? The Pampa News writes, one subject of controversy in this mystery is in regards to what cargo was or was not on the plane. The U.S. Army officially lists two KB-29 Bombay tanks, medical supplies, and miscellaneous tools. However, there are many who believe that highly classified documents and an atomic weapon or atomic weapon parts were also on the plane. The Daily Advertiser observes that the C-124 transport often was used to transport nuclear weapons, and Cullen's airplane was part of the Roswell-based 2nd Strategic Support Squadron. Imsden agrees, telling the Daily Advertiser, they found something. I think it was a broken arrow. The Pampa News noted the odd nature of the search. The search continued into Monday, but hope of finding the crew alive was fading. In most cases at this point, the search would have scaled down considerably. However, to the surprise of many, the search actually intensified. This fact is yet another reason people believe that there were indeed atomic weapons or parts on the plane. The Daily Advertiser suggests that the possibility that a nuclear weapon was on board might explain the conflicting answers and secrecy. The loss of such a weapon overseas just months after the Canadian incident, at a time when the Korean War was heating up and the Cold War was peaking, could have had international repercussions. Amsden told the Advertiser, Nobody wants to touch this thing. They're scared to death of it, and I don't know why. I firmly now believe that they were carrying a nuclear weapon. 
Maybe the C-124 that day simply crashed, a victim of the weather or the engine problems that caused the crash the following May. Maybe the men aboard died when it exploded in the air or when it crashed into the water, or maybe they made it into life rafts and died of exposure before rescue could reach them. After all, Barry Peterson told the Emerald Globe News that he doesn't want to speculate, he doesn't want to guess. It isn't information, it is merely the circumstances that make this seem like an old episode of the X-Files. But maybe there's more to it. As Larry Rafferty, whose father, Captain Lawrence Rafferty, was on the plane, it was his valets that was found in the water, noted, they have been lying about this for 60 years. In the absence of information, of course theories will arise. And families are left to wonder what happened to their loved ones. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy, and if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community and locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop, book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo.